The center of power is evolving. Over the next few decades, China will probably become the largest economy in the world. For people in the West, for younger people, to not have a thorough understanding of that uh, is missing the biggest trend of our lifetime. China is a place that you need to get to know. It's going to be influential. It's going to have an impact on your life and the life of our country. We're doing so little <laughs> to respond to this changing world. And I think this initiative is a very important one to help bridge the gap. The Schwarzman Scholars Program is going to be a lot like the Rhodes Program. We're going to be selecting some of the top students in the world as potential leaders to go to China, to Chenhua University there. The Schwarzman Scholars Program curriculum was designed with inputs from not only Tsinghua University professors, but the professors from Harvard, Yale, Oxford, Cambridge, as well as inputs from political and business leaders in the world. They're going to be able to meet the leaders of the country. They're going to have a mentor to show them how China actually operates. They're going to have several trips to other cities in China, and they'll get a master's degree in their one year. Schwarzman College is designed to be a unique physical setting so that scholars can study together, live together, uh, and have some fun together. In this very complex world we're living in, it is so important for China and the United States to have a good relationship, a relationship based on mutual trust. The Schwarzman Scholars Program and Schwarzman College will help in that process. The challenges we are facing has created a pressing demand for the younger generations to study together, to collaborate together, to find the solutions to the most demanding challenges we are facing together. The Schwarzman Scholars will uh, help shape the future of international relations by shaping those who are going to uh, determine that future, the young leaders of the future. Schwarzman Scholars are sophisticated thinkers and have a facility in navigating the most complex issues um, that we face. My dream is one day the world political and business leaders who are making critical international decisions come from the Schwarzman Scholars program. Having education and understanding is a lot better than conflict. Institutions such as this uh, can bring about that education and understanding, which is essential to a peaceful world. In 50 years, there are going to be 10,000 Schwarzman scholars. That number of truly gifted individuals who become leaders not just politically, but in various other fields, have the ability to change the way countries around the world think. In the 21st century, China is no longer an elective course. It's core curriculum. I'm Jim Marshall, the president of the Institute of Peace. I brought this thing up here hoping that I could give it to somebody who would help me turn it on. So I'm not competent enough to do that. But hopefully I'm competent enough to welcome Madame Liu. We're very pleased to have you here. And Ambassador Sui, uh, so much to have you back, sir. And uh, Steve Schwartzman. Thank you. Where's Steve? He's right in front of me somewhere. Uh, so Steve, so Steve, thank you, right next to Madame Liu. <laughs> Uh, uh, we wouldn't be here but for Steve and, and wholeheartedly agree with the comments made by some of those appearing on the screen. 
I mean, it's very clear that uh, the United States and China need to touch one another in many, many, many different ways over many, many, many different years. Uh, President Chen of Tsinghua University uh, has been a partner uh, and will be a greater partner for the United States Institute of Peace as the years progress. I certainly hope so. We hope so. Uh, the Institute is active where China is concerned. We've done a number of Track 2 and Track 1.5 dialogues. I was in China in June, uh, along with Stephanie Klein Albrand, who is the director of our uh, uh, Far East programs. Uh, and, uh, and it was a track 1.5 dialogue with our Chinese partners, Kicker. Very interesting, very productive, and I just think more and more and more of that sort of thing needs to happen, and the Schwartzman Scholars Program, the Schwartzman's College, is going to do exactly that. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Institute was established in the mid-80s. Uh, it grew gradually. We have about 350 employees now. We have a beautiful building. Uh, and what we do globally is try to resolve conflict without violence. You know, our mission basically is to stop fights, to help people resolve their differences without fighting uh, to resolve those differences. Uh, we are uh, uh, successful a very small amount of the time that we work, but when we're successful, it's enormously important. We work with governments, NGOs, both foreign and domestic, in order to accomplish this. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, have you here to talk about people-to-people -people exchanges because it's one of the things that we really believe in where the Institute is concerned. And with that, I think my task is to invite uh, President Chen uh, to the stage uh, and uh, sit and listen to what will undoubtedly be wonderful remarks if somebody can just help me turn this thing on. <laughs> President Chen. Thank you, Jim. Your Excellency Vice Premier Liu Yandong, Your Excellency President Marshall, Your Excellency Mr. Frostman, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'd like to thank Mr. Marshall and the U.S. Institute of Peace for helping the Schwarzman Scholars Program of Tsinghua University to organize this speech and the reception later. Tsinghua University has a history of over 100 years. One century ago was the ambitions of bringing strength to the country and prosperity to the people. Young people have set out from Tsinghua Garden and arrived in the United States across the oceans. They have learned Western academic theories, knowledge, and methodologies in the United States. And then Tsinghua University have gradually developed into a crate of outstanding talent, the source of frontier knowledge innovation, and the bridge of Chinese and Western cultural exchanges. Among the over 200,000 graduates of Tsinghua University, we have seen a large number of academic masters, entrepreneurs, and statesmen, including over 30 party and national leaders of China. And Madam Liu Yandong, who will deliver an important speech today, got enrolled in Tsinghua University in 1964. Today's China, based on reform, opening up, and faster development of the 30-plus years, endeavor to achieve the Chinese dream of the great renewal of the Chinese nation through deepening reform comprehensively and opening up wider to the world so as to make greater contribution to world peace and development and progress of human civilizations. In today's world, while the trend of globalization, IT application, multipolarization gains momentum, we have also seen increasing imbalances, conflict, and problems, and faced long-term and complex common challenges in energy, environment, health, security, and climate change. For the future, we will start to gain if we cooperate and lose if we become isolated from each other. We need a way, a mechanism, and a bond to bind countries in the world, including China and the United States, closer to each other to cope with the challenges and seek common development. An ancient Chinese saying goes, just as the Yangtze River surges forward, wave upon wave, each new generation excels the last one. Youth represents the future and hope to achieve lasting peace and prosperity of mankind. Not only our generation, but also the young generation need to make arduous efforts. Therefore, we want to make some efforts in the cultivation of the young personnel. 
Tsinghua University has introduced the Schwarzman Scholars Program to build a platform for the most talented young people in the world to learn from each other and communicate with each other so, th so as to build lasting friendship of their lifetime. Our goal is to cultivate future leaders with global perspective, noble character, and cross cultural leadership. They will be able to jointly reflect on and resolve problems and challenges in the world development and work together to pursue the Chinese dream, American dream, and the world's dream. President Xi Jinping and President Obama sent messages of congratulation, and Vice Premier Liu Yandong attended the inauguration ceremony and delivered an important speech. And Secretary John Kerry also sent a video congratulatory message. And today, this program is included in the China-U.S. high-level consultation on people-to-people -people exchange. History is always full of beautiful coincidences. In the early days of the Tsinghua University, the main design of the campus was finished by Mr. Henry Murphy, a outstanding graduate from Yale University. One hundred years later, the major building of the Schwarzman School is once again designed by alumni of Yale University, and he is the dean of the Yale University School of Architects, Mr. Robert Stern. We believe that this building will become another hallmark building of the Tsinghua University. I know that in the United States, it is not right if you talk about Yale University without mentioning Harvard. So I want to thank Mr. Bill Corby of Harvard University, and I also want to thank Mr. Uh, Professor McFarlane of the Business School of Harvard University. Yale and Harvard have cooperated for this program of Tsinghua University. I think this is truly valuable, and I want to express my heartfelt thanks. Of course, not only these two world-famous universities, but also politicians, political leaders, educators, entrepreneurs, philanthropists, artists from a, de a number of countries across the world have been following closely and supporting this program. And this program has become a fine example of bringing together wisdom across the world and promoting innovations through cooperation. I want to take this opportunity to express my thanks to people across the sectors of the society who have supported this program. We are going to celebrate the Thanksgiving, so I want to thank Mr. Stephen Schwarzman, a great financial expert and philanthropist. Without his generosity and hard work, the Schwarzman program will not come to what it is today. His name is now closely connected with Tsinghua University. He has become a goodwill ambassador of Tsinghua University and of the Chinese people. Now, let's give a round of warm applause to Mr. Stephen Schwarzman, who will describe to us the beautiful future of the program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Chen. It's an honor to be here today in conjunction with the fourth annual U.S.-China Consultation on People-to-People -People Exchange. Today, Washington plays host to an important dialogue designed to foster mutual understanding and respect, which is the bedrock of successful, peaceful relations between nations. Anyone fortunate enough to hear the speeches given earlier this afternoon by Vice President, uh, Vice Premier Liu and Secretary Kerry at the State Department can attest to the thoughtful insights into global affairs that these two vastly experienced leaders possess. It is a great honor in my capacity as Chairman of the Schwarzman Scholars to host this event in honor of Vice Premier Liu, said it here in the front row where she and I seem to be with great frequency, uh, and uh, the rest of her delegation, including the Minister of Education, Yuan Juran, and the Minister of Health, Li Bin, to Washington for this gathering. I also welcome other members of the delegation from China and the ambassador here from Washington. It's great to be with all of you again. 
I also welcome members of the U.S. delegation, as well as friends and supporters of the Schwarzman Scholars. Thank you to Jim Marshall for your partnership in this event and for playing host to us today in this important establishment, the U.S. Institute of Peace, which is really a spectacular building, and one of the prettiest in Washington. Today's People to People Exchange honors many of the same principles that Schwarzman Scholars was designed to advance. Believing that education can play a critical role in shaping future international relations, my vision was to create an elite scholarship program oriented to the 21st century world and designed to prepare future leaders in business, politics, journalism, academia, and other fields to engage constructively, even when tensions flare. I want to create an environment where students from the United States and other nations can learn as much as possible about China, its history, culture, economy, people, and motivations. Conversely, Chinese students will have the opportunity to build lasting relationships with fellow Schwarzman scholars from around the world. Fostering in future leaders a deep respect for others' cultures and countries can help the world avert conflict. Without the capacity for some people to say to another nation, I've been there, I've learned about the culture, and developed positive ties to its people, leaders in politics and business alike will find it difficult to engage in productive and mutually beneficial relations with international partners. As Madame Liu herself wrote in an excellent recent editorial, and I encourage you to read it, sincere people-to-people -people exchange can rise above differences in history and social systems to give a strong boost to relations between nations. This is my hope for the Schwarzman scholars, that we can encourage a way of thinking in our most promising students that values mutual understanding and positive people-to-people -people relations. Considering how far along we are in the development of the program, I recollect with a profound sense of astonishment my first conversations with President Chen at Chenhua, who just introduced me, where I've been a member of the board of Chenhua's School of Economics and Management for many years. The development of this program in the intervening years has been an incredibly rewarding challenge for both of us and our friend David Lee, who's the dean. We could not have accomplished what we have without President Chen's exceptional vision and leadership and the support of our partners. There aren't many programs like this in the world. Starting them from scratch is not the easiest thing you could ever imagine, but it couldn't be done without the goodwill the vision and the courage that President Chen has. Chen was one of Chinese most prestigious institutions of higher learning, even though many people in America have not heard of Chen Hua and can't pronounce the name. It's not easy for Americans, no. but it is one of the most famous universities in China and some would argue the most famous. Its alumni have made outstanding contributions to China's growth over many, many decades. The thousands of Schwarzman scholars to come will be incredibly fortunate to have the opportunity to study on a campus defined by its vibrant intellectual life and history of each East-West collaboration. I'd like to acknowledge Schwarzman scholars Dean David Lee. David's up here in the second row who's here today, in addition to his prior service on the People's Bank of China's Monetary Policy Committee, David is a preeminent economist. I know of no one better suited than President Chen and David Lee to help run and build this innovative program. It's actually a great joy to be working with people with this kind of intelligence and flexibility and commitment to excellence, which they both have. We were especially gratified by the enthusiastic endorsements given at the time of the program's announcement in April by President Xi, as was mentioned, 
as well as President Obama, who I talked to uh, about the program, who had just instant enthusiasm for it. He said, it's just what I believe in. This type of connection between people uh, is really important. And it's one reason, in terms of his instinct, that relations between China and the United States are doing so well uh, at the moment. We've also had the support of Secretary of State John Kerry, who I've known really since the late 60s. Uh, uh, John, uh, when we announced, uh, I talked to him about the program, he said, geez, can I, can I just take over your program? This is such a wonderful thing. Uh, and I said, no, John, this is a private one. Uh, and uh, his intuitive support of people-to-people -people exchanges, of which this program is a prime example, is, is really deeply felt uh, over many years, and we're lucky to have John uh, in his current position, as well as Henry Kissinger's support. Uh, Henry is uh, you know, sort of the father of our relationship with modern China, uh, and uh, when I asked Henry to join our uh, our advisory board, it was like an instant yes. Uh, and he said, this is the type of thing uh, that we should be doing. Uh, it broadens you know, our relationship with China and it helps ensure the future uh, of uh, our countries going forward. And so Henry did a, a, a nice video. Nobody has to do things like this, but he did it because he really cares about China and about the Schwarzman Scholars Program. The outpouring, uh, outpouring of support since we started from around the world has enabled us to reach uh, increasingly close to our $300 million goal. We're at $261.5 million, but who's counting? Uh, and now we realized, as we want to do more and more things, we probably need $350 million. So it's like any startup, you think you know where you're going, and as you do more, you learn more. Uh, so we'll continue to be uh, uh, fundraising. Uh, this commitment we're making to China financially represents the largest single philanthropic effort in China's history, with funds coming largely from outside the country. In America, we're used to doing things philanthropically. Uh, and this is a little different because we're taking American ethos and we're moving it to China. Uh, and we think that's a natural thing in China. This is something quite unusual and a little bit odd. Uh, but I hope that this provides a template for other projects of this kind of type uh, and for China. And I'd like to briefly acknowledge Bank America, Ernst & Young, and our friends from Lenovo, all of who've given to the program and happen to be here today. So what you deserve and what you're getting is what we call a nice shout out at an important event. So thank you. We've also made great progress in the development of curriculum and the design of our program with the help of an exceptional advisory board, many of whom you saw in the video, and a group of leading academics from around the world who make up our Academic Advisory Council. This is a remarkable group of people. Uh, we have the former head of Oxford uh, as part of this group, uh, along with, with professors from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Duke, uh, uh, Stanford, Chicago. It's, it's really an amazing outpouring of uh, major organizations like Steve Orleans, who's here today, uh, where the com academic community globally has mobilized itself to make this program into a huge winner. I, I get phone calls from the heads of universities around the world who just want to stop in and say hello. Th these are places I couldn't get accepted uh, when I was younger. Uh, you know, whether it's Oxford or Cambridge, I applied to scholarships for both of them, I didn't get in, and now they're calling, and people are stopping into the office to talk. Uh, it's, it's really an amazing uh, sort of change uh, in, in my life, because I have a real commercial life. And this is just a part-time uh, type of thing for me. But it shows how much the major universities in the world care 
about making this program successful. And it's a testament not to me, it's a testament to China and the status in which China is held and the desire of major universities around the world to facilitate the continued development of China. It's actually pretty selfless on the part of these people. And from my perspective, in the for-profit world, it's pretty remarkable to watch this occur. The last month, we broke ground on Schwarzman College, where the program will be housed. You got a chance to look at it on the video. It's about 260,000 square feet. It's patterned off of colleges in Oxford or Cambridge uh, or Harvard or Yale. Building and very functional that Bob Stern uh, at the Yale uh, School of Architecture has designed. I believe we're at a unique period in history where we will have an opportunity to create an international network of future leaders who understand China, who understand one another, and who can foster deeper understanding through the relationships they form, the work they do, and the positions of influence to which we expect them to rise. It is our responsibility to take advantage of that opportunity and to do all that we can to ensure that we leverage it for the betterment of mankind. On that note, I'm so honored to introduce Vice Premier Liu, a leader whose support for cultural exchange initiatives reflects her deep understanding of the challenges set before the international community for the centuries ahead. A Chenhua alumna herself, Madam Liu's immense dedication and commitment to service has led to various opportunities to serve in leadership roles with increasing levels of responsibility throughout the Chinese government. Her recent election in 2012 uh, to the 18th Chinese Politburo and her appointment as a vice premier earlier this year is a testament to her considerable talents as a stateswoman and a leader. I see her with great frequency. Uh, I think it was dinner Tuesday night, two or three times today. China uh, last month, uh, and I've gotten to know her over the last six, seven years that I've been on the board of Chenhua's School of Economics and Management. I always look forward to seeing her. Uh, she's always enthusiastic, balanced, insightful, uh, and a terrific person, and I regard her, which you're not allowed to say at events like this, as a friend. Uh, so, Madam Liu, this, the floor is yours. President James Marshall, Mr. Stephen Schwartzman, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, good afternoon. I want to thank Mr. Schwartzman for your introduction. I believe that Mr. Schwartzman, with your insight and enthusiasm, you have uh, cooperated with my alma mater, Tsinghua University, in designing this Schwarzman program, and it has received great attention from the presidents of our two countries and strong support from various famous universities across the world. I believe that this program is about laying the foundation for a better future of the world. It will educate or produce outstanding professional talents. So I believe that the establishment of this program itself is a good measure to enhance people-to-people -people exchange between China and the United States, and also reflects cooperation between our two countries. I believe that with joint efforts by various sides, this program will be a big success. 
And I also want to thank President Marshall for inviting me to the prestigious Institute of Peace. And I also see that the Institute is actually in the central area of Washington, D.C. I was told also that the uh, office of uh, President Marshall is the most beautiful one in the entire United States or even in the whole world. Therefore, I feel very glad to meet my friends, my old and new friends today. At this very moment, what comes to my mind is a line of Chinese ancient poet. I'm joined by erudite scholars in good-spirited talks. When learned scholars are gathered together, sparks of wisdom will inspire brilliant ideas. The experts present here have been supporters for and personally involved in the friendship between China and the United States. Your great vision has been a strong driving force for the growth of bilateral relations. Let me take this opportunity to extend warm greetings to you all. Thank you for your active contribution to the China-US relationship. Ladies and gentlemen, the third plenary session of the 18th Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, CPC, was concluded 10 days ago. It has drawn the curtain of China's sweeping and profound reform at a new starting point. The document of the plenum has been released, arousing strong resonance with, within China and tremendous interest in the international community. I believe you are very interested as well. Let me take this opportunity to give you a briefing on the meeting. First, China's the uh, plenum this time has released a message like this. That is, China's reform will be a comprehensive one. In the Chinese political vocabulary, the third plenum implies reform. It was the third plenum of the 11th CPC Central Committee in 1978 that started the historical process of China's reform and opening up. In the past 35 years since then, China's economy has grown by 142 times, income of urban residents 71 times, and per capita net income of rural residents 59 times. 35 years have passed and this third plenum has once again laid out an all-round and systemic program of reform covering the economic, political, cultural, social, ecological, and other areas. Nearly 300 major reform measures under 60 items are set out in the 16-part document. Such scope and intensity is unprecedented. Undoubtedly, this third plenum will be a new milestone in China's reform and opening up. Second, the overarching goal of the reform is to improve and further develop socialism with Chinese characteristics and make progress in the modernization of state governance system and governance capabilities. A country cannot become modernized without modern governance. Mr. Deng Xiaoping, the chief architect of China's reform and opening up, pointed out in 1992 that it would take 30 years before a complete set of more sophisticated and established institutions in all fields takes shape in China. The goal of building a modern governance system and modern governance capabilities is to improve various institutions and make them more scientific to become more capable of running the country with institutions and laws and to turn systemic advantages into effective governance. It is aimed at making governance more scientific, democratic and law-based, more responsive to the requirements of China's economic and social development and better meet people's expectations. Third, the priority of the reform is economic restructuring, and the core is to strike a balance between the roles of government and market to make sure that the market plays a decisive role in allocation of resources, 
while bringing into better play the role of government. As developed still holds the key to settlement of all issues in China, economic structural reform is the focus of this round of reform and will lead reform in other areas. The change of wording from basic to decisive in describing the role of market in resource allocation is one major theoretical breakthrough. It has been proven by both theory and practice that it is most effective for resources to be allocated by market. It is a law of the market economy for market to determine how to allocate resources, and it must be followed if we are to have a sound socialist market economy. We will improve the basic economic system and vigorously develop the economy of mixed ownership, featuring the growth of both public and non-public economic sectors. We will speed up improvement of modern market regime and promote macroeconomic regulation and institutional reform in the fiscal and taxation, financial and investment sectors. Efforts will be made to further transform government functions, streamline administration, delegate power, innovate the way of administration, and significantly reduce direct involvement of government in resource allocation. In the meantime, we will give better play to the role of government. On the one hand, we will address the problem of excessive government intervention through power delegation to stop the government from managing affairs that ought to be left to the market. On the other hand, we will address the problem of misplaced role of or inaction by the government by strengthening regulation over issues that fall within its mandate and making sure that the government does what is right to make up for market failures. Force efforts will be made to better safeguard and improve people's livelihood. To enable all the Chinese people to enjoy more of the fruits of development in a more equitable way and lead a happy life, that is the ultimate goal of all the work of the Chinese government. In recent years, China's input in people's livelihood has increased significantly and it kept growing even when the fiscal revenue growth slowed down due to the financial crisis. In the first quarter of this year, China's economy experienced a minus growth. However, we still maintain the large input into this area and continue to improve the system of basic public service. Our input in education has been improving by 18% annually and the input for science and technology by 20% and our input in health care, housing and social security has also been increased. Our economy has faced downward pressure for several months and the government cut public spending by 100 billion RMB yuan but the spending for people's well-being has not been reduced. In future we will continue to improve the system of basic public service. We will deepen the comprehensive reform in the education field, push forward the education reform focusing on equity and quality, gradually narrow the gaps between schools, regions, and urban and rural areas, and ensure good education for children in both urban and rural areas. The total number of Ch Chinese students is 260 million. If we also take into account children and kindergarten children, then the whole number is 310 million. So the number of Chinese students is only 20 million less than that of the United States. 
our spending in our government spending for education accounts for 17.6 percent in the government revenue which is the largest proportion. We will also improve the system and mechanism for employment and entrepreneurship, build an interconnected mechanism between economic development and job creation, and achieve higher quality employment. In the coming five years, China needs to create 12 million new jobs each year. For next year, for instance, we need to find jobs for 7.2 million college graduates. Therefore, job creation for university graduates represents a major task for years to come. We will also form a reasonable and orderly pattern of income distribution, grant more property rights to farmers, enhance the income of low-income groups, increase percentage of middle income, and strive to narrow the income distribution gap between regions, industries, and urban and rural areas, and gradually form an olive-shaped distribution pattern. We will set up a more equitable and sustainable social security system, fully incorporate the farmers who settle down in cities into the urban housing and social security system and build a multi-tiered social security system. The coming eight to 10 years will witness China's urbanization. During the past 35 years since the inception of reform and opening up each year about 100 million rural residents moving into cities, 10 million rural residents moving to cities. And this trend will continue into the coming years, and they should have a equitable access to social security services. So we will need to build a multi-tiered social security system. Fifth, we should promote social equity and justice. The comprehensive deepening of the reform must focus on creating a more equitable and just social environment. Otherwise, the reform will be meaningless and unsustainable. We will adhere to and further improve the system of National People's Congresses, promote consultation-based democracy and grassroots democracy, develop a system of people's democracy that is more extensive, thorough and sound, and guarantee people's rights to information, participation, expression and supervision. We will reform the judicial management system and pursue integrated development of the country, government and society under the rule of law. We will combat corruption, place power under close checks, and make sure that society is both vigorous and harmonious with good order. Six, it is imperative to build a new system of open economy. The Chinese economy has been deeply integrated with that of the world. We will promote the synergy between opening up in domestic and international fronts and the combination of coming in and going out. We will ease the investment entry serohood, unify laws and regulations for domestic and foreign investment, step up the building of free trade zones. We have already started the Shanghai Pilot Free Trade Zone and the experiences will be applied nationwide. We want to realize efficient allocation of resources and expand common interests with other countries. In the next five years, China will import over 10 trillion US dollars worth of goods make over $500 billion of investment overseas and have 400 million outbound tourists. China will always be open to the outside world. Seventh, it's important to handle well the relations among reform, development and, sustain and stability. China's reform has entered the deep water zone with tough issues to be tackled. To make any breakthrough, we must have the courage to crack the hard nuts and face the difficulties head on. Meanwhile, as a major country, 
China should never make fatal mistakes on matters of fundamental import importance. We should be bold in pushing forward the reform, and but we also need to take steady steps because more haste is less speed. We will combine the resolute will for reform with practical policies and measures and combine top-level design with crossing the river by feeling the stones so as to find a path suitable to our national conditions and development stage. All in all, we will further the uh, third plenary session this time has put forward such a message that is we will further free and develop social productive forces and unleash and enhance social vitality through deepening reform in all respects. We will strive to achieve the objective of building a moderately prosperous society by 2020 and realize the Chinese dream so as to enable the Chinese people to lead a better life. So the reform is a daunting task. It is about six, 15 areas and includes 700 reform policy measures. So we need to have the resolve and determination to work towards our goal. China's reform will not only serve as a strong impetus to its own development, but also open up wider space for mutually beneficial cooperation with the rest of the world, including the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, in about a month, we will celebrate the 35th anniversary of diplomatic relations between our two countries. And this year happens to mark the 35th anniversary of China's reform and opening up program. The third plenum of the 11th CPC Central Committee held in 1978 made a historic decision for reform and opening up, which completely changed the course of co contemporary China. The plenum concluded on November of November 28th, and on December 25th, our two countries decided to establish diplomatic relations. The fact that these two events happened almost at the same time is not a historical coincidence, but a natural result of our strategic decisions. The past 35 years has seen faster economic development and more benefits delivered to the people than at any other period in China's history. It has been proven that the process of China's reform and opening up is also a process in which China and the United States expand win-win exchanges and cooperation to the mutual benefit of our people. Today, no one doubts anymore that China-US relations are one of the most important bilateral ties in the world. With a total land area of over 18 million square kilometers, our two countries account for over one-fifth of the world population, one-third of the global economy, and one-fifth of global trade. Given such magnitude, China-U.S. relations have gone far beyond the bilateral scope and increasingly assumed global significance. Sound China-U.S. cooperation can serve as an anchor for world stability and will boost world peace. We are now in an important stage of China-U.S. relations to build on past achievements and usher in a new future. The two successful meetings held between President Xi Jinping and President Obama at Annenberg Estate last June and in St. Petersburg last September ushered in a new stage of building a new model of major country relations between us and mapped out a blueprint for overall bilateral ties. President Xi aptly summarized such a new model of relations in three phrases, namely, no conflict or confrontation, mutual respect, and win-win cooperation. President Obama also stressed that we need to explore a new state-to-state -state cooperation model. It's fair to say that the important agreement reached between the two presidents reflects their political wisdom and sense of historic responsibility toward building a new model of relations between major countries instead of repeating the historical pattern of conflict between major powers. 
This great cooperation across the Pacific will create an even brighter future for our two countries. To build a new model of major country relationship is an unprecedented endeavor that is inspiring for future generations. Given the huge differences between China and the United States in history, culture, development level, social system, and way of thinking, some people have misgivings about such a new model of relations. So at uh, today's plenary session of the CPAE, the anchor woman from CCTV said when she just arrived in the United States, she felt that Americans did not have much confidence, and Americans instead felt that Chinese people were slow in reaction. But as time goes by, she has come to realize that we can complement with each other in this area. As we are so different from each other, we can see some people have misgivings about this new model of relations. History has seen too many conflicts and wars between emerging powers and established powers. And I say this in the US Institute of Peace, this is what happened in history. This is referred to as the tragedy of great power politics by Professor Miersheimer of the University of Chicago and as the Thucydides trap by Professor Allison of Harvard University. But time has changed. As human civilizations evolve, the world has increasingly become an interdependent global village. China and the United States have forged a community of common destiny with our interests closely entwined. What has happened shows time and again that engagement and cooperation are much better than estrangement and confrontation. As long as China and the United States work together, we will surely be able to break the historical pattern of major country conflict and confrontation and blaze a new path of peaceful coexistence, positive interaction and productive cooperation. Here I would like to share with you a story which happened 70 years ago. It happened in the 1940s when China and the United States fought shoulder to shoulder against the fascism. A US pilot named William Finkley was once flying on a reconnaissance mission in China's Yunnan. In order to take clearer terrain pictures, he had to lower his aircraft steadily in the air till the plane finally got hit and he crashed landed in Yongle village of Pengchong city. After the incident, the local villagers, who were very thin and weak themselves, took turns to carry William on their back and moved him around in the mountains for the following three months to escape the search of enemies. William was in the end rescued and saved by the villagers. After retiring, William had hoped, even in his dreams, that he could visit Yongle again, which he regarded as his second hometown. But his dream did not come true and he passed away. After the establishment of diplomatic ties, however, his daughter was able to visit Yongle village every year to fulfill the dream of her father by making donations to the local primary school. Today, hanging at the Yongle primary school, there is a gong, a metal plate used to tell the time when drummed. Simple as it is, it was in fact apart from the plane flight by William back then. Every morning, children of the school start their new day with the drumming of the plate, now a symbol of peace and China-US friendship. Every great nation aspires for spiritual excellence. It is the persistent pursuit of their dreams by successive generations of the American people that have made the United States what it is today, a modern country brimming with creativity and vitality. The United States is a great country, and the American dream a great people. The American nation is characterized by a strong will and a pioneering practical and innovative spirit, as well as a respect for knowledge and talent, cultural diversity and inclusiveness, a tradition of science and law, and an ability to adapt to changes. All those qualities compel admiration. 
The Chinese people have long cherished the dream of harmony under heaven and always valued such ideas as harmony between man and heaven, following the law of nature, peace being the most valuable, harmony without uniformity, and do not do unto others what you do not want others to do unto you. Today, the Chinese people dream of a prosperous country, national renewal, and a happy life. The Chinese dream embodies the common pursuit of the Chinese people since modern times and reflects the most fervent aspiration of the contemporary Chinese people. The Chinese dream is not to challenge or compete with other countries, but to focus on managing our own affairs well for the benefit of our country and our people. China will work for the Chinese dream through peaceful development. By accomplishing the Chinese dream, we will be able to better undertake China's international responsibilities and make greater contribution to world peace and development. The Chinese dream has much in common with the American dream and the world dream. They all cherish the same emotions and expectations, and they all value the right to pursue a happy life. The Chinese dream brings not only benefits to the Chinese people, but also win-win results to China and the United States, and opportunity for prosperity and progress to the world. While pursuing the Chinese dream, the Chinese people wish to work with the American people and people of all other countries to realize the world dream. Ladies and gentlemen, state-to-state -state relations in the final analysis are about relations between the people. It is the tiny streams of heart-to-heart -heart communication between our people that cross the barrier of nationality, belief and culture, and provide nourishment for the towering tree of China-US friendship. In 2010, responding to the strong call from both sides for closer people-to-people -people exchange, China and the United States jointly established the mechanism of high-level consultation on people-to-people -people exchange, which has since received strong support from governments at various levels and active participation of people from both countries. I have come to the United States for the first round of high-level consultation on people-to-people -people exchange after the change of government in our two countries to implement the important agreement reached between our presidents and add new impetus to the building of a new model of major country relationship. Just now in the State Department across the street, Secretary Kerry and I co-chaired the closing ceremony of the high-level consultation. Thanks to the close collaboration between our teams, the consultation has produced 75 outcomes in education, science and technology, culture, sports, women and other fields. Our presidents have sent messages of congratulations. The message of President Xi reads like this, I hope China, U.S., Consultation on people-to-people -people exchange will build on past achievements and open up new prospects, expand areas of communication, deepen cooperation, and make new contribution to building a bridge of heart-to-heart -heart communication and the development of the new model of major country relationship. And President Obama has expressed his high hope on this new model of major country relationship. Therefore, we need to implement the important agreement between the presidents and take people-to-people -people exchange to a new height so as to lay a solid foundation for the building of the new model of relations. China and the United States now engage in wide-ranging, multi-tiered and high-quality people-to-people exchange. This exchange has reached unprecedented level in both frequency of visits and depth of interaction. Currently, 235,000 Chinese students are studying in the United States and 68,000 American students are studying in China under the 100,000 Strong Initiative. Back in China, 260 million young Chinese are learning English. And here in the United States, 200,000 college, secondary and primary school students are studying Chinese. We have forged 240 pairs of sister provinces and states and cities, and a total of 3.85 million people made mutual visits to last year, and countless more interact via internet and mobile phone users. We have now 600 million internet users and 800 million mobile phone users. We have jointly sponsored education institutions and expanded joint research programs. The sharing of knowledge and Technology has inspired new ideas of innovation and become a new highlight in our cooperation. Today, on the campuses of our universities, one can often come across energetic students from the other side 
who are fluent in both Chinese and English. It is amazing to see how fast they progress in their academic pursuit and how eager they are to learn about each other's history, culture, and society. From China's remote mountainous villages to the local communities in the United States, more and more of our teachers, students, artists, scientists, athletes, women are experiencing first-hand cultural diversity in a more genuine and lively way. Such an effect is not something that can be achieved by textbooks or media coverage. The well overwhelming trend of people-to-people -people exchange between China and the United States is a vivid testament to the notion that amity between people holds the key to friendship between states, and it is reshaping the course of state-to-state -state relations. Today, people-to-people -people exchange, political trust, and business cooperation have together become the three pillars underpinning the new model of major country relationship. People-to-people -people exchange brings long-term benefits. We should promote institutionalized regular exchanges in key areas part of the broader endeavor of building the new model of relationship and nurture a spirit of cooperative partnership with a strategic vision. People-to-people -people exchange has its roots in the people. We should extend its reach to remote villages and urban communities and encourage greater involvement by scholars, businesses, and social groups. People-to-people -people exchange has its essence in culture. We should enrich and deepen such exchanges in thinking so that they truly serve as a bridge or bond that carries ideas and spreads culture. People-to-people -people exchange has its charm in its inclusiveness. We should share the useful experience in promoting economic growth, cultural prosperity, technological advancement, and social development to pursue common progress through mutual learning. People-to-people -people exchange has its future in the youth. We should focus on generations X and Y in the United States and those born in the 1980s and 1990s in China. As they jointly pursue their dreams, the tree of China-US friendship will be watered by people of one generation after another in our two countries and will be flourishing and ever-growing. Ladies and gentlemen, think tanks are the dream workshops of thinking and the reservoir of strategies. We cannot build a new model of major country relationship without the support and involvement of our think tanks. Your insightful perspectives are crucial for promoting strategic trust and strengthening people-to-people -people exchange between our two countries. I hope that our think tanks will extend their focus on such hard areas as power politics and geopolitical competition to include such soft areas as science, education, culture, social and people-to-people -people exchanges, interact with our countries in greater depth establish mechanism for communication and thereby serve as a bridge for greater mutual understanding. I hope think tanks will carry out extensive joint research, study how a new model of major country relationship should operate, and identify the laws governing the growth of bilateral relations. I hope you will encourage all parties to view our respective strategic inter intentions in an objective and rational light. Pro propose new ideas and approaches to implement the principles of no conflict, no confrontation, mutual respect, and win-win cooperation, and serve as a vanguard in intellectual innovation. I hope you will always cherish goodwill, encourage the media and public in our two countries to put themselves in the other's shoes, respect each other's cho choice of social system and development path, respect each other's core interests and major concerns, and enhance the social foundation of China-US relationship. That says a good example of exerting positive influence on the public. Ladies and gentlemen, cultural exchange and harmony is an irreversible trend of human civilization. Diverse cultures will only shine brighter when they come into contact with one another. As long as we build a bridge of communication across the Pacific Ocean to enable the over one billion people in our two countries to know more about each other and forge a deeper friendship, people-to-people -people exchange between us will grow stronger and create new splendor as it brings together Eastern and Western cultures, delivering greater benefits to our two peoples and the whole world. To the south of where we are, across the Constitution Avenue, sits the Lincoln Memorial. So let me conclude my speech today with a quote from President Lincoln. 
a new model of major country relationship and deeper people-to-people -people exchange between China and the United States is, in the final analysis, to quote him, of the people, by the people, and for the people. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Lu, for those uh, wonderful remarks uh, uh, referencing uh, President Xi's commitment to resolve differences between our countries without violence, to respect one another, and to have win-win situations. And it's certainly true that uh, Steve Schwartzman, uh, President Chen, uh, your cooperation with one another with the Schwartzman's College program assures that we head in the right direction as far as win-win situations are concerned. I would ask that the audience remain in their places uh, for the uh, formal uh, party to, uh, to leave. And, uh, and I, I guess the official delegation should leave now. Ah, we have a... Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats until the official party departs.